Listen, if you want to learn how to lead generate, lead follow up, lead convert at a high level, you want to learn to get more leads, leverage more leads, convert more into listings, convert more listings into closings, you need to be at the leads, listings, and leverage class that we're going to be teaching is a three hour class. There's no cost. We're not charging anything for this. You just need to show up. Listen, my name is Michael Hellickson. At one point in time, I was the number one real estate agent on planet Earth. I'm telling you, I can help you out. I was literally at one point in time closing 120 to 180 transactions a month and had over 750 listings in active and pending status. Whether you're brand new in the business or an experienced team leader, you need to be there at this event. Bring your team members. I'm going to get them fired up. I'm going to get them excited about taking their game to the next level. We're coming to your city next. I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't show up at this event, you're going to wish you had because your competitors in your marketplace are going to be there and they're going to be learning exactly what to do. I'm going to be giving you literally the specific lead sources I use to crush it, the specific lead sources that our coaching clients are using right now to generate anywhere from one, two, ten, even a hundred listings a month. Listen to me. You have got to be at this event. I'm telling you right now, it's the best thing you'll do for your business in the next 12 months. So. Go to clubwealth.com forward slash events, clubwealth.com forward slash events. You're going to love it. I promise. I absolutely guarantee you'll come out of there with exactly what you need to make an extra six figures in the next 12 months at the bare minimum. Love to see you there. So success through specialization, specialized, finding your specialty, whatever you want to call it. I got coach freaking Aaron Dressel with me right here. I'm talking Aaron, the man, the myth, the legend, Russell. Now, listen, for those of you that don't know who Coach Aaron Russell is, he's kind of a big deal. And he's going to be sharing with us today how we can, through specialization and through really figuring out what we're best at and really honing in on those skills, how we can make more money. We're going to keep it fairly short, but I want you to know that we're going to go deep on the parts that you need to know. Now, before we do that, let me tell you a little about Aaron. So Aaron runs one of the most successful brokerages in Utah, uh, and he's done it without the use of polygamy, which is really cool, uh, because I think that's a thing. thing? It's a a tricky thing, but we pull it off. You pull it off. So you don't even have to do it with that anymore. So like that, that works. You didn't have to marry like 50 wives to be able to be successful. You've got like hundreds of people in your brokerage now. I can't remember. What are you at? Like 250 people in your brokerage or something like that? Almost. I mean, we're getting closer. We're about one, we're not at one eighties right now, but we're making 180. So yeah. But 180 people in your brokerage, that's substantial. That's pretty awesome. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Making good progress. Dude, that's and that's awesome. I'm stoked to hear that. And so Aaron has been for the longest time one of the most sought after broker owner coaches in Club Wealth. People love this guy and he has moved the needle for more people than I can tell you and begin to tell you. Uh, that being said, we also it would be I would be remiss if I didn't share with you that we have an event coming up in Salt Lake uh, together. Aaron and I do. It's going to be a half day event and it's not going to cost you anything to attend. So uh, I'm not going to go into detail on that right now. Uh, just go to clubwealth.com forward slash events, clubwealth.com forward slash events, and you can find out all about it. Uh, but man, I'm telling you, you're going to want to be there and uh, we're going to go really, really deep with you there. So Coach Aaron, talk to us about specialization and and really figuring out what your specialty is in this business. Because, you know, you hear, you hear about people talk about, you know, well, if you look at the medical profession, right? I got general practice doctors over here and they do fine, but, you know, the heart surgeons, they seem to make more money. Even a podiatrist makes more money than a general practice doctor. So it seems to me that specialization makes sense and, and not trying to be the jack of all trades and the master of none. I want you, I want you to talk to us about that for a little bit. Well, I think the the thing is like if you look at people in real estate, like if you talk to like a lot of people just in the marketplace, and you ask if they know of a real estate professional, like they most of the time know a realtor. Like the realtor is such a generic term, and it kind of fits the bill for a lot of people. And the hard part of that is if you look at the national st- like stats, uh, even in, like in our local market, if you look at that, the, all, we have about twenty thousand realtors in the state of Utah, wow. and. In the last year, half of those people didn't sell a single house. So like the hard part is like if you get grouped into that group, now like you could be grouped in with someone who never sells a house because you have like this generic term that's now like placed upon you. And so like one of the key things is like kind of stepping apart from that. Cause if you're like, if you're like, I don't know, like when I was like building up my business originally, I I was at a bigger brokerage and what became frustrating for me is I have to go meet with a client and they would say, oh, 
oh, you're one of those. Like we already met with one of you guys. I'm like, well, that's, but that's not me. Like yeah. that was like, that was somebody else who had the, the, that name, but that was like, that's not, mm-hmm. that's not me. And so like, sometimes when it's too general, it like minimizes our unique abilities and what we bring to the table because they, they just naturally think they already know who we are mm-hmm. based upon the law of average. You know, that's actually really interesting to hear you talk about it in that way, because I agree with you. I think people have preconceived notions about real estate agents, right? They they've they kind of develop in their mind based on their experience with whoever they knew that was a real estate agent. It was usually somebody from high school or brother, sister, mother, cousin, or, you know, the 10 other people they know that have a real estate license that do pretty much nothing with it. And they figure that that's kind of how everybody is, you know? Well, I know John over here, he doesn't really work hard. He just kind of hangs out all day, plays Xbox and sells a house once in a while. And look at how much money he makes. It must be just really easy. And, and uh, you know, these guys are all schmucks, right? That's just- Yeah, so whatever, whatever their preconceived notion is, yeah. like you now just fit that. Like they just define mm-hmm. you by that. So, and the hard part is oftentimes we minimize our, like what our unique ability is because we just ge- give that generic term. And we just say, well, I'm this. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what that is because of, and they have their definitions already internally of like, oh, I already know what that is. And like, and they're one of those, okay, got it. And if, if it's a bad experience or if it's someone that doesn't do anything and they're like, okay, you're one of those, got it. I'm just going to group you and categorize you as that now. Well, you know, I think it's also interesting, you know, you talk about, you know, how people place a label on you, you know, it's, it's similar to where when somebody's new to the business, right? Maybe they were a police officer before a firefighter before they did something else, whatever it was, they were a teenager, a high schooler before whatever it was, then all of a sudden people's perception of you is what you were before. And they, and they don't translate that to, no, I'm a professional real estate agent now. And this is, this is what I do. And I work very hard and I'm very focused and I do a great job for my clients. I'm very professional. Um, you know, people don't, they don't see that a lot of times. So let's, let's come back to how do we, how do we change that paradigm? How do we change the attitude of, well, you know, you're just like all the others that I know that do what you do. I think that, I mean, you talked a little bit about the specialization idea. And I think what I've found over the years is I find different niches that, that I like have found ways of setting myself apart that I can kind of specialize in different things. And sometimes I think the mistake that becomes that people try to specialize in one thing and it becomes the only thing, Mm -hmm. but you can specialize in many different things and you become an expert depending on the person that you're talking to. So I I remember when I first started out, um, I was young, I was in my twenties and um, a lot of my databases kind of around that, that same age. And my sister, she was going to college at the time. And when I talked to my sister, I told her, I said, Hey, just so you know, like I specialize in first time home buyers. And she was like, oh, that's good to know. Because so when she was in classes and she was talking to different people, she would say, oh, my brother's in real estate. But what he specializes in is first-time home buyers. And so when she would refer me, that was kind of my specialty. And it was especially, that was my specialty to her. And I was then, literally just going to ask you that. Right? Like that was like my, and then be, I became more like competent with foreclosures and investment properties. Mm-hmm. And then I would talk to people who had money and I, like for them, I was not a first time home buyer specialist. I was a foreclosure specialist or I was a investment specialist. So when I would talk, so depending on the audience that I had, I had kind of, I would say I had five or six business cards. It was the same business card, but I would like have different ways that I would present myself to those different people. So people with money, I'd say, oh, you know what? They'd be like, well, what do you do? I'm like, oh, actually I help people when they're buying investment properties. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, like, yeah, that's why I work in real estate. Like, oh, but you specialize in that? Like, yeah, yeah, that's that's like one of my specialties. Like work with, oh, is that something that, well, yeah, like I, like uh, that's something I'm interested in. Like, oh, okay, great. Like that, then we should talk some more. So I would always frame my conversations and when I would describe myself as what I envisioned the need that that person might want. And so, and it was fascinating. Like I would work with clients um, I started working with clients who had siblings who were real estate agents, but they would look at their siblings like, oh, my, well, my brother's an agent, but he just does like traditional real estate. Like, oh, well, that's good. Good for him. Yeah. Like, I do the investment stuff. So we should talk some more because like, if you want, he's like, yeah, yeah. My brother, like, he just does like the buying and selling of houses. Like, oh yeah, yeah. That's good. Like, I mean, you need people like that. And so, and I would just kind of minimize the generalness of that. And I would just become the specialist in whatever unique angles that I was looking for. And this market we're moving into is, uh, it's going to be amazing because it's going to create 
yeah. unique opportunities for people to specialize in unique things. And the general practice agents are just going to be kind of like, oh, well, we've always done this thing and this is what we do. And it just becomes very monotonous and it's kind of lost because it's like there's not much uh, uniqueness to it. So I love where you're going with all this. And, you know, it's interesting because I think, number one, especially coming into this new market, there's no substitute for hard work. They're going to have to get back to base. They're going to have to work really hard, but they're going to have to do more than just that. That will be required to continue to make what they're used to making uh, because there's, we're, again, we're going to lose a lot of the marketplace, right? You know, some are saying we're going to lose another 25% of the agents this year and who are in the next 12 uh, months to 24 months. And who knows? Nobody has a crystal ball, but that's what happened in 2008 to 2011. Uh, we lost uh, about 25% of the agents. And, uh, but I think it's important. I think it's good. I think it's a good thing for the, for the marketplace. But working hard is not only required, it's just not enough. You've got to now add some other arrows to your quiver. And specialization is one of those arrows. Uh, I love it. I can, I'm, in, I'm envisioning you right now. I'm seeing you going to, you know, Barnum and Bailey's or Ringling Brothers. And, you know, I can see now you're, you're, you're going to the, you know, the guy tying the balloons, the clown tying the balloons. You're like, well, I, I specialize in selling homes to clowns. That's what I do. I, I, I'm well, a clown. the thing is like, the thing that like really stood out to me is I was in a conversation with my friends and he told me about this, like up this trend that's going on. And I don't know if you've heard of these, like, go, like what are called ghost kitchens. Have you, have you heard of those I've at all? I've not heard of that. So what ghost it? kitchens. So what's happening is that you have companies out there that have made these kitchens in kind of industrial parts of the city. And then what they do is they create a front of different types of food. So they have like a website for like Asian cuisine. They have a website for Italian food. They have a website for Mexican food. It's the same kitchen that's fulfilling the orders of all these different restaurants. So they have like four or five different brands, mm -hmm. but they're all out of the same kitchen. Yeah. So, so when somebody goes online and they can't, they, there's not, it's not a real restaurant. So mm -hmm. you can't go to this restaurant and order food, but you can go online and you yep. go to like, like Uber Eats or DoorDash or, and then you can go on like, oh, look at this, like, look at this place. It's got a lot of reviews. It's a Mexican restaurant. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Look at all the Mexican food they have. I'll order Mexican. I feel like I want to get that food. And the order comes into the same kitchen and yep. they're like, oh, cool. We're making Mexican food right now. And then, and the same thing, it's the same kitchen that's making Italian food. And like, so you have like these different people that are hungry. They have different tastes, but they're all coming to the same kitchen. Instead of having one restaurant that's trying to advertise to every every single person out there. Brilliant. Brilliant. I love it. I think it's fantastic. You think about the economies of scale that are created by doing that. It's insane. And you can put that same dynamic to work in your business. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, the reality is, and, and it's interesting because I, I think as professionals, we understand that, well, look, I can help a first-time buyer just as easily as I can help somebody buy in their third or fourth house, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's you know, being a first-time buyer specialist uh, in in our minds is, that's just like, you have to know how to handle these things as as kind of a prerequisite. And it's, so it, it's the specialization as, as far as we look at it is not real necessary, so we don't market it. But the, what we fail to realize is, the importance it carries in the minds of the buyers and sellers out there, the, 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 the importance that it carries, the weight that it carries in the minds of the consumer. And when we talk about specialization, when we say, hey, we specialize in whatever it is you are, whatever it is you're looking for, whatever it is you need, then guess what? They're a lot more likely to want to work with us. I think that lowers that barrier of resistance for them. So I, I think it's fantastic. I think that's a great, great strategy. Yeah, and you look at like other professions have done that really well. Like, I mean, I mean, I don't really like to, like to compare myself to attorneys, Mm -hmm. Because it's not like, but I mean, the, you look at attorneys and like, they've like become specialists, right? You have like the ambulance chasers, you have the litigators, you have like the, the, the trust and like, and divorce. And they have all these like specialties that they kind of do. But many of those are all under the same umbrella of one real estate firm. They just have different people who have marketed different arms of that, that are reaching out and mm -hmm. touching base. And, and what I find is that um, people will pay to leave a situation that they're in. And what I mean by that is if, if people understand like a pain point and they feel like people understand where they're at, like they'll pay to leave that situation more so than they'll pay to, to mm -hmm. join a place. Like, or like, so what happens is if we try to like sell stuff, then they're like, I don't know if I want to buy that, but they'll, but I'll pay to get out of my issues. Like if I, and so if they feel like people are marketing to their issues and where they're currently at, they'll pay to get out of that versus someone who's just like generally, because like you look at a, Going back to that analogy of the restaurants, um, like the Cheesecake Factory has like the most like diverse menu of any restaurant out there. 
Mm-hmm. But like people, when they think of Mexican food, they don't think of going to Cheesecake Factory. Or when they think of like, I want some like Asian cuisine, they don't think of the Cheesecake Factory. Like they, even though they have all that stuff on their menu, they're just like, they've, like they're trying to be this one stop shop. Um, but most people think of Cheesecake Factory to go get some cheesecake and maybe some food that revolves around it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's good. It's oh, I love it. Market. Yeah. I, I think it's a great move. I think it's, I, I think it's something that it's easy, really easy to implement. Uh, and what you do, you know, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm the agent out there, how do I, how does this look in day-to-day implementation? So there's a couple of things that I think uh, agents should consider. Number one, just in our conversations that we have with people, we just need to be aware and cognizant of, you know, what is it they need uh, and how can I be that specialist for them? How can, you know, so just being aware and making sure that we're having those conversations, number one. Uh, number two, I would suggest that we can literally build systems around the different specialties. For example, if I'm a, if I'm going to say, okay, I'm a first time buyer specialist, great. So I'm going to do first time buyer classes. But you know, I also you see, so I, I did three different classes on a regular basis in my market when uh, when I was selling real estate. So I did first time home buyer classes, I did investor classes, and I did seller classes, and uh, they all worked fantastic. Now at, at some point, I also started doing uh, pre foreclosure and foreclosure classes, so people got to understand the foreclosure process and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, you can literally do different classes in each specialty. And what, what happens is you create a marketing channel. This is kind of to your point with the restaurant, the ghost restaurant or the ghost kitchen. You create a marketing channel for each of these things. And what does that really mean? Well, I'm going to run Facebook ads for first time home buyers, and I'm going to run them into a funnel that's going to then kind of get them into my conversation with them of being a first time home buyer. Then I, once I nail that down and I get that dialed in, then I go do it with sellers, right? And I might do it with divorcing sellers or people that are going to become empty nesters, selling a home for the first time or, or, you know, buying your retirement home or moving down, you know, like there's all these different specialties you could do this with and you just create little funnels for each one. And, you know, you get a couple of leads here from that one, a couple of leads here from this one, you know, all of a sudden before you know it, you've got a bunch of business coming in from all these different funnels and you're the specialist in all these different things. But what they have seen of you is all, well, he's the divorce specialist. He handles people that are going through a divorce. Well, fantastic, right? Uh, so I love it, Aaron. I, I think this is great advice. I think this is something that people can implement right now. Um, what, what else would you? What, what else would you? Like, I would add on there. I mean, if you can start to capture the reviews and and if you can get on video the experiences of people who you've taken down that path, so they can share their journey of where they were at to where you helped them to get to. Because what people relate to is mm-hmm. the place where those people were originally at. So if you can take someone from where they did not own a house to the, when they own a house, and then you ask them, what were, the, what were the struggles and challenges that you ran into before we met? And have the video being addressing those different concerns and issues. So the minute that someone watched that, oh, that's me. Like, I'm totally at that same place. And then they see the path that you're able to help and be the guide on the side to get them to where they want to go to. You're like, oh. This is, this is great because this is where I'm at. I want to get to that place and I'll go down that journey. And if you can start to, start to create some different YouTube videos around that and create some marketing messaging and show various evidences of success. And I would say the more that you can make the, the people, the heroes in the journey, and then the people are going to relate to that. Because if you start to do the whole branding where you're the hero in the journey, that's like, that doesn't really like resonate as well with people because it th- sounds too self-serving and but if you can make them the hero and you can say, wow, like, look at these people. They were like battling this and they were, it was so hard for them. And look at what they, they were able to accomplish. You create the drama built into that. Then people are like, oh, that, that's what we want. Like we want to move into that, that place too. And that's, those are all unique channels that you could have. You could have YouTube littered with all these videos of the struggles that people are in getting to where they want to go. Well, and I love that because it also provides that social proof, right? People want oh, what other sure. people have and, and they, they want to know that I'm not the first one to work with this person. I'm not the first one to go down this path. I'm not, you know, I'm not experiencing this for the first time. When they see 5, 10, 20, 30, or however many different testimonials, video testimonials, you know, whatever of people that have gone down a similar path with them. So for example, I wouldn't want to put my first time buyer testimonials on my seller ads. And I wouldn't want to put my seller ads on my first time buyer testimonials, uh, you know, or vice versa, right? I want to make sure that my testimonials are pertinent to that specialty. And the more you can whittle that down, the more you can dial in the marketing, you'd be surprised at how quickly this can accelerate the responses that you get from these various marketing channels. Um, so, I, I, by the way, I want, to, I want to touch back on one of the things you mentioned, Coach Aaron. 
you talk about the difference between hope for gain and fear of loss. And I, I really think that we we can't let that just kind of slip by. People are far more motivated. There's only two things that motivate people, right? Hope for gain or fear of loss. And they are far more motivated by fear of loss than they ever are for hope for gain. And so you've got, and, and what do they want to lose? In this case, in most cases, when someone's buying or selling a home, generally speaking, there's a pain that they're want, they're trying to get away from. There's something that they're trying to to move away from because it's causing them problems in their life for one reason or another. Maybe the house is too small. Maybe they don't like the neighborhood there and they don't like the neighbor next door. They don't like their spouse. They want to get divorced, right? Whatever. So you've got to speak to their pain and you've got to share to your point, social proof of other people that had the exact same pain and you, how you solved it. And now you and your company become the solution. They become the hero in the journey, as you put it. Right. Um, so now it's, you know, gosh, you know, Aaron was going through this, this divorce and it was so hard for him. And, he, you know, he and his wife were struggling and they got the help they need. Now, obviously, if you're doing it with a divorce situation, you've got to make sure you've got their permission to use this as a testimonial. But, uh, but you know, you walk them through, hey, here's all the pain they went through and the challenges. And they, and they finally made the decision that, hey, it's time for each of us to go our separate ways. And we now we got to figure out what do we do with this big house that we bought together? How do we get rid of that? And then you walk them through that process. But then it's now here's where we ended up. We both ended up with a great place that we both you know, that each of us loves and we're, you know, in, in new relationships. Whatever. That's probably an extreme example, but you get my point. Uh, so that said, how, look, what at else? That, look, at, look, at, look at the Israelites back in the day. It mm-hmm. took one night for them to leave like their, like their slavery in the Bible. And then it took them 40 years to find like the happy place to be. But mm-hmm. then one night they're like, all right, we're out of here. Like we're done. And people will make quick decisions to leave their pain. Mm-hmm. Like they'll like they're like we're out of here we're done like we'll make that move and and the hard part is like if you went to like those the slaves or the Israelites back in the day you're like oh this is this cool place we can go to they're like yeah like we just want to get out of like this terrible situation that we're in right like, and like and people just want to get out of that place whatever mm-hmm. that is and just they'll make quick decisions to that versus the the other thing you're trying to sell them on the other side hundred percent. I love it. That's great. So you'll be able to get people to take action faster. All right. So I want to transition to another type of specialization for just a minute, because I get a lot of people in the industry think that, hey, you know, I'm just going to do it all. I'm going to work with buyers and I'm going to work with sellers. And and this one for me is is a very, I I get a lot of people get very touchy about this topic. And I'm, I'm curious as to your take on it. Do you feel like people make more money when they work with both? Or do you feel like they stand to make more money when they specialize in one or the other? With buyers and sellers? Uh-huh. I mean, my feeling is that they both are interchangeable and in the fact that they create business with each other. So, I mean, if you if you have listings, they create more buyers. And then buyers are typically just listings. Like if a high priced buyer is usually a listing, they don't they don't call themselves a listing because they see they self-identify as a buyer. And so I think that like oftentimes they're so I mean if you have a million dollar buyer, it's a five hundred thousand dollar seller. They just don't they just don't call themselves that. They call themselves a million dollar buyer. They're like and so I think that they are inter like they're interrelated and they're tethered together oftentimes. And so um, so having competency in both, I feel like is is a, is a kind of a game changer for many people. So okay, so let me sh- I'm going to challenge you on that a little bit, and I want to see I want to get your take on this because I'm a real believer, and and this is good. I I love it. I, I look if there's one thing I can't stand, it's webinars and podcasts where everybody agrees on everything. Like I just I get so sick of it. I'm good. I'm, I'm up for a healthy yeah. discussion. Yeah. yeah, let's like like I just. I, I just love, I, th- I feel like both sides need to be debated. I feel like, you know, and so even if you don't believe it, I want you to we'll argue have, we'll vehemently people, for we'll the- have yeah. vote. We'll have people vote down below which side they agree with in the end. Perfect. I love it. That's, pretty, that's exactly so what you, so you present your case first and then I'll come back and I'll have my argument. So I love we'll it. We'll we'll have the, the public opinion will be the judge and then you like present your case and I'll have my, my case. And we'll just like, we'll have like questions and then- in the end, we'll see how the jury of our peers decides on the. I love it. Okay, so the two options are, I either am a generalist and I work with buyers and sellers, or I'm a specialist who only deals with buyers or only deals with sellers. And so here's my argument for specialization as opposed to generalization. So I would suggest that as with any profession, 
those who truly specialize, right? And, you know, we start talking about the trial lawyer who is just a trial lawyer and does not do all the other stuff on the side. He just goes trial. He makes more money than the guy that's trying to do it all. Well, the, the doctor who's a, a specialist doctor, she's going to make more money than the generalist who just works with family practice. Now, here's how that relates to working with buyers and sellers. I would also not only argue that if you specialize, you get really, really good at being the world's greatest buyer agent or the world's greatest listing agent, whichever one it is, your trans your, your hit ratio will go up. You, your conversion percentages will go up. You'll actually make more money at the end of the day. And you will be providing a better service to the client. And here's how. I'll give you an example. Mr. and Mrs. Drussell, for example, are thinking about uh, selling their home and buying another home. Well, listen, as a buyer, right, they don't want the the snarly pit bull with an attitude they want the golden retriever they want somebody who's going to be nice to them and you know who's going to take time with them and give them you know a little space not push them not not be relentless with them they're going to want someone who's going to nurture them over a long period of time give them world-class customer experience and not pressure in any way the mr and mrs drussel as a seller however when they've got their house that they got to sell look they don't even want you in their house half the time when you come to the listing appointment. You're a necessary evil. They just want you in and out as quickly as possible. What they really want is that snarly pit bull with an attitude. They want the person that's going to come in and freaking get the job done. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you do. All I care about is get me the most money possible in the least amount of time with the least amount of headache to me. You can accomplish that. Go get it done. I don't need you to be my friend. But as a buyer agent, if I'm going to be out looking at houses with you, I want you to be my friend. I want you to be nice to me. So... That said, I will also suggest that the numbers don't lie. That if you look at the numbers and you compare what a generalist makes versus what a specialist makes, the specialists make more money. That said, Aaron, let's hear your counterpoint. Okay. So I think the stats are skewed because the, the people who are listing agents and the ones like if, if you look at the specialist, most of the time you're looking at listing agent stats. And you're looking at specialists who are listing agents. And I would say that anybody who is good at listing is going to have higher stats. So the so like those numbers are going to be skewed because like they're listing more homes and the and people who list are going to be making more money. Now, the problem with that is if you have like people who are only doing buying and only focus on buyers, they're missing opportunities to potentially list homes because they're turning those over to other people to go and list those houses. Now I get it. There might be people that are really, really good at listing homes. But at the same time, the challenge is, is that those buyer agents, they are going to start to feel at point that they're missing out on opportunities of income from the listings because the grass is green on the other side. They're going to see the missed opportunities. And what it creates is a feeling of missing out. There's a FOMO of not listing homes. And so those agents are naturally going to want to be in that role. And so you create like a weird relationship where those agents feel like those listing agents haven't earned those like transactions and it's not fair because now all these people are working on that. So on um, so that what's happening is that you have like this. Now I get it. Like if you look at a team that plays offense and defense, you have different like, people that play. But if you have a player who's really good at both sides, like you want that player on the field as much as possible. Like you might want them to be on both sides of the of the ball. You might want someone who's a really good specialist on the uh, like playing and the defense, and if they can play offense too, and they've got the stamina to do it, then that's great. Like you want them on the field as much as possible. And I would say that people who are really, really good, like you want them to be in both those spots because what will happen is if they don't have the opportunity to be on the other side, they're going to leave and go somewhere else where they have the opportunity to play both sides. I get the argument, but I don't agree. So I love where I love the argument. I do. I love the argument. Here's where I why I don't agree. First of all, I do agree with part of it. The part that I agree with is that they're going to get FOMO and boohoo. I want to do both. And, and, and my response to that is who freaking cares? The world doesn't care what you want. The world's going to give you what you deserve, right? You're, you're going to get what you deserve because you reap what you sow and you, you don't reap what you want or even what you need. You reap what you sow. And so freaking boohoo, cry me a river. You can want what you want. I want to be good looking, but God bless me with a great face for radio. Like, come on. I mean, at some point in time, we've just got to accept that we're great at one thing and not at another. And so I think about this as a listing agent, I'm not aware of anybody that's ever listed more homes on this planet than I have. That said, I have about this much patience with buyers. I'd be out there. I'd show them like the third house. I'd be like, dude, this is like the third house we've looked at. Are you going to make an offer or what? Like, what's going on here? Like, why are we still going and, you know, why am I schlepping you around from house to house? I got better things to do, right? 
And so I look, I look at the buyer agent trying to be the listing agent. And I think, okay, they're going to go in there. And one of them, there's, there's things that you have to do as a listing agent that are a different skill set than a buyer agent. A buyer agent has to have empathy. A listing agent should not have empathy. And I'll tell you why. Because if they're in a hardship situation and you're empathizing with them, you're not solving their need from a professional standpoint. What you need to do is you need to be pragmatic and you need to address the issue and let the emotions stay by the wayside so you can get done what needs to be done so that they can get the outcome they're looking for. I get a little passionate about this if you can't tell. But that said, let's take it to the next level. So if I'm a buyer's agent, not only do I end up going out there and I'm too nice to them to get them to do what they need to do, right? Buyer agents tend to be nicer people than listing agents by and large. And I'm just going to call it what it is, right? And that's that's good. That's not, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. And, and because people need different things at different times. That said, when, when I take the nice agent on the listing appointment and the person's overpriced, it's a lot harder for the nice agent to get that thing priced where it needs to be than it is for the jerk like me that goes in and says, listen, you and I don't get to pick the price for your home. The market's going to tell us what it's worth. And right now, the mar- what do you think the market's telling us? But based on these numbers, do you think it's telling us it's worth a million? Or based on the comps, do you think it's telling us that it's worth maybe a half a million? right? Buyer agents going to have a hard time with that. They're going to want to be friends with the person. So I'm looking for a listing agent to be a higher D versus a buyer agent who's generally speaking a higher I. Uh, so that said, I, uh, I'd love to hear, give me your counterpoint. Tell me I'm wrong. Show me how I'm wrong. I would say in the market we're moving into, it's critical to have empathy with the sellers because we're moving into a process in a, in a time when agent when the seller is going to be more emotional than they have in years past. And so what's going to happen is those sellers who are super emotional, they need to feel like the agent can relate to them and understand them. And a, a powerful agent who has a high eye will be able to go into them and, ha- and say to them, I can appreciate and I can appreciate where you're at. But what we want to make sure of is that we can, and if they can understand the core needs that, that person has, then they'll be able to go back to that as the driving force of why the price needs to be reduced to go back to that process. So when they say, for example, someone like they're getting divorced and they say, I got to get this house sold because of, and they say, well, then why is it important to get the house sold? Because I got to move on to this. And whatever that core thing is, like, then the, the price of the house comes back to the core need of what that person has, which is going to be like relieving themselves of that house. They need peace of mind and they need the benefits that they're trying to buy. And that's where you can have some powerful discussions on price reduction because you empathize with them. They feel they're being heard. And then you're able to use those core things that are the driving decision-making pieces for the seller and help them make those choices. So we're moving to a market right now where there's going to be high emotion. And I would say that agents are going to be have to step into those hard, hard conversations. And if there's not enough relationship capital in those relationships, it's going to be hard to have those conversations with sellers because the sellers are going to be very guarded and they're going to feel like the agents are more concerned with selling the house than what their needs are. And that's where the disconnect will come in. Okay, so let me, I, I, I can appreciate that. I I can understand how you might feel that way. I, In fact, I'll, tr- truth be told, oh, I think that way was my stuff. You're, you're becoming empathetic already. Look at you, you're already trying to like, you're so, moving from the D to the I in our like, negotiations right now. So, I, I like it, I like it. All right, go ahead, go so ahead. I, so so I, I can understand, and I used to feel that way myself, Aaron, at one point in time, but w- what I found was that when I was on these literally thousands of listing appointments I've been on with people that were going through foreclosures, short sales, pre-foreclosures, foreclosures, all of it. Uh, everything from, you know, somebody's just missing, getting ready to miss their first payment all the way to somebody that I've got to kick out of their house because the bank asked me to. Uh, and, and I know you've been on lots of those as well. But I, what I found during these literally probably, I would, I would say it's probably approaching somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 of these appointments in the life of my career. And what I found is that the very last thing they needed was for me to empathize with them. And the very first thing they needed was for me to do what needed to be done and get the job done. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, I'm going to give you a graphic, horrible example, but, but it's a great one. All right. You, you're going to the doctor to have a hemorrhoid looked at. The last thing you want is somebody being your best friend in that moment and holding your hand and, hey, we're going to get through this together. You're just like, dude, could you just get the job done so I can get out of here and and keep what's left of my dignity, right? Like, you just want to peace out. I don't want to deal with this, right? And so you've got to really think about where they're at in their life. If you really have empathy, 
you've got to respect and understand that they don't want you there. They're embarrassed about what's going on. They want to get this done as quickly as possible, and they don't want to think about it. They just want it out of their minds. And the best way we can do that is to get right to the point, because here's what happens. As soon as we get wrapped into the emotion of the situation, we go down a rabbit hole. We no longer can serve them as a professional. Now we, we've gone down an emotional rabbit hole and we can't have the tough conversations that need to be had in order for them to get what really they need to get out of this situation. Yeah. Well, then the, I would add to that, that <laughs> the, the people, the, if you look at the the, the stats, I'm, I'm just making up stats off my head, but these are things that I've heard in the past. And that is that the typically in a relationship, if it's a, if it's a, um, a male female relationship, that the wife is one who makes the decision about 80% of the time when it comes to houses. Mm-hmm. And so the hard part is I think the high D and that, like that, that driving part will work a lot with guys to relate with them. But I think the empathetic side will work with the female to be like, like understand where she's coming from. And so you're connecting with the person who's actually typically the one who makes it now, especially on the buy side, but on the selling side too, if you don't have that empathetic um, connection with people, then what happens is like, it becomes like you're almost mansplaining the real estate process versus like empathizing and being able to help them through that process as a guide on the side. I, I can appreciate that. Uh, so that said, I think at this point, I think it was, I think, it's good. I think we both have back a, and forth. What's I, that? It's been a fun discussion. It would be fun to like, we can even like take it to the stage sometime at a, at an event. We'll see, like, we'll have the, like the audience pick through their cell phone. They'll like be able to vote and we'll see like which direction they go. Well, I would like to know for those of you that are on Facebook watching this right now, type into the, the, the comments in the Facebook on, on the Facebook post. Why don't you type in there, which direction, which one, and, and, and it's not about who won or who lost, although we all know who won, I think we can <laughs> agree on that, but but that's not what it's about. But I think <laughs> what I want to hear is, would you go emotional or professional in this situation? So that's all we're going to, that's what I want to see type in the chat, emotional or professional when it comes to dealing with short sales and foreclosures, uh, type that into the chat or the comments right now. And uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, well, we'll see how this plays out. It's good. I want to see how it plays out. I'm excited to find out. So that being said, Coach Aaron Drussell, I can't thank you enough. I'm really excited about the event that we've got coming up. First of all, we got a couple of big events coming up. We've got Business Strategy Mastermind Conference. Uh, of course, you're yeah, like that's coming up soon. It's like a it's like a week and a half away. Uh, it's a week from yesterday, I think. Yeah, a uh, week from is that right? Yeah, a week from. Yeah, it's coming up. Oh, sorry, two weeks. Two weeks from. Two no, weeks. two weeks from now will be over. I don't know. It's coming up quick. It's <laughs> yeah. Two weeks from now, it'll be like ending. It'll be like the end of it. So that's correct. Two weeks from now, we'll be at Disneyland eating a Mickey Mouse ice cream together. But uh, that being said, uh, I want to. Uh, Brittany's giving the we, our producers giving me the the tw- it's twelve days knucklehead. All right, I got. It. I appreciate that, Brittany. Thank you. The twelve uh, days of BSM, like like that's typically like there's like a gift given away like the twelve days leading up to it. It, it almost seems like we should have an advent calendar for BSM, yeah. right? Don't sense. you think? Like yeah. chocolate, chocolates inside, something like that. I'd be legit. I, I would. I'd be down for that. Hey, so here's what I'm going to challenge you to do, Coach Aaron. So at the event at BSM, I I, I didn't think about this beforehand, but uh, I want to do this. Uh, I I think I'd like to see you and I on stage together swapping dad jokes. I think oh, uh, right. I think that could be fun. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a video. Lee, Coach Lee posted something on his Facebook group or on his Facebook page here. Uh, it was, I think it was this morning. A couple of guys swapping dad jokes. I thought you know that'd be fun to do that with Aaron sometime. All right. Uh, so we may need to just we may need to look at that. All right, I'm game. Okay. All right. Good stuff. So I will see you then in uh, in a couple in twelve days, and then after that we'll be seeing you in Salt Lake City in mid November. Uh, so which and, and by the way. This part, uh, they're going to be cutting this out of the video, of course, so that it's not part of the the. Uh, and Brittany, make sure you cut that out for the uh, the actual Club Ball TV episode. But um, but November sixteenth is the event that we're going to be doing in Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah. Is it in actually Salt Lake or is it somewhere else? Is it Draper? Yeah, it's right down to Salt Lake. Yeah, it's just right there. It's just oh, Sandy. Okay, she's telling me Sandy. Um, it's going to be three hours. They're going to be talking about leads, listings, leverage, and. Uh, Coach Aaron's right. The market has shifted and it's going to shift even harder. And nobody knows what it's really going to look like. Nobody knows. Are we going to see a big foreclosure boom again or not? Um, I will tell you that we're starting to see some foreclosure. We're starting to see people defaulting on loans already. Um, 
you know, obviously this is a different environment than it was in 2007 to 2011. So nobody really knows what's going to happen. Uh, I'd be curious, Aaron, what's what's your prediction? What do you think is going to happen? Do you think we're going to well, see I mean, a wave of foreclosures or just a few trickle in? Or we? Oh, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the challenge, you've got so much Wall Street money in the market now that I think a lot of banks will take non-performing assets and sell like large swaths of that to like these huge groups. And they'll kind of like just liquidate it before it ever hits the open market. Yep. Um, but that'll be like so. Who knows? Like that. Like that wasn't really a factor before. But I think you're going to see more of that. Um, but I think you're gonna, right about that. But I think the biggest thing that I'm excited about when the market starts to change is we're at a market that we're moving into where people can negotiate again on the buy side. Mm-hmm. And you got a lot of people with a lot of money who have been sitting on the sideline, just waiting for the opportunity to come back in and negotiate in the marketplace. The the people with cash the last couple of years. They still want to play because most of the people I know with cash don't like to overpay for stuff. And so when you have cash, you want to come in and be able to feel like you have some leverage. And when you're coming into a marketplace where you're paying full price or above and people kind of thumb their nose up and like, oh, I'm not, you're a cash buyer. Like, I don't even care. I'm going to take this other offer who's like for way more. And the cash buyer is like, well, then fine, I'm going to wait. And they've been kind of sitting on the sideline. And now the game is being played where the, 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 now it's almost time for them to like to sub in. And it's like, all right, well, now the game is like my, this is my speed. Like now I can start to negotiate. And so I'm seeing more and more of the people who've been on the sidelines stepping up. And it's going to be interesting because now there, there's plenty of money out there in the world. It's just been waiting for the right time to come into the marketplace. And so I think, I think you'll see some changes in that coming up. I think you're spot on with that. And, you know, it's interesting because you talk about the ability for buyers to negotiate. If you look at, you know, if the price comes down just a little bit, we're actually, even though the interest rates have gone up, you're actually, your payment's going to be the same. And yet now you're capturing that house at a lower price point. And we know, you know, interest rates are going to go up and down, up and down, up and down, right? I mean, that's just what they're going to do. At some point, we don't know when that is, but at some point, this market's going to bottom out. At some point, they're going to have raised interest rates enough that they're going to have accomplished what they've been trying to accomplish, which is to stop inflation and to stop this crazy appreciation that we've had that's been driving inflation. And when that happens, they're going to want the economy to not die, right? They're not going to want to see us all of a sudden go into a, a depression. And so what are they going to have to do to kickstart that economy again? They're going to lower interest rates, right? So as soon as interest rates go lower, well, guess what? You've locked in the house at a lower price now and interest rates come down. Guess what? Now you get the lower price and you get to refinance. And that's when your payment actually comes down. You still own the asset at a more reasonable price. And it's an asset that's going to appreciate. And if you look at it over the long term, there's never been a 30-year period in history where prices haven't gone up. And so no matter what you buy now, you're paying it down, you're getting the tax deductions, you're you're you know gaining appreciation. And at some point that thing's paid off and you own it free and clear unless you just continue to roll it for cash flow. Yeah. Well, then you're gonna rents are gonna keep going up, so they're not going down. So rents will keep going up. And the other thing to keep in mind is that we're like a year away from moving into the next election cycle. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so this next year, it's okay if the economy's not that great because you know what's going to happen in 2024? It's going to be amazing because we want to get reelected. And so they're going to like, they're going to game the system, Mm -hmm. whatever they can do to like have this amazing economy that comes back and they'll say, see, what we've figured out and what we've saved you all and that you should vote us back in. It's just, it's amazing how it's all going to work out in 2024. That's right. You know, like it's going to be an amazing recovery so that people can get reelected back in. Yep. No, I, I completely agree. And so, you know, I think really with the, the, the message that I get out of that is stay the course, work your tail off, right? Keep your nose to the grindstone, keep your foot on the gas, uh, develop really, really good habits on a daily basis. And and I love Scott Pierce's comment. He says 80% professional, 20% empathetic. I like that, Scott. So I I think I think what he's really saying, Aaron, is that I won. Uh, anyway, that's it. I think, that's like, I think that's your mom that logged in there. Scott's like, <laughs> like it's like a relative of yours, or like Scott's like a cousin of yours, or like you've got like these like gamed like all these different like relatives that are stepping in. If we oh, go back and look at a bunch of bots from the Philippines that voted, yeah. then it's yeah. all off. So yeah, yeah, you, you you may be right about that. Honestly, though, I think if it was actually my mom and not Scott, uh, and by the way, for those of you who don't know Scott Pierce, uh, look, hey, this is the guy that uh, invented and owns and created uh, listings to leads. Uh, probably the best dollar for dollar. That's amazing. Leads. He's like, yeah. like his, his system is unreal, though. No, truly, truly. Yeah. No, Our worker really uses it. Like yeah. our agents all use it. We teach classes in our brokerage all the time. It's it's uh, 
like dollar for dollar, probably the le- best lead yeah. generation program that's out there. 100% agree. 100% agree. Which was, dang it, we're, we're not supposed to agree. We're supposed to be point counterpoint here, man. We can't be agreeing on stuff. You're just very so, empathetic about it. It's all good. I'm not being empathetic at all. Very, very Stop calling eye. me empathetic, Aaron Dressel. Very high eye. Very high eye. I appreciate it. Good. <laughs> So if you guys, by the way, if you guys want a discount, you want to get the Club Wealth discount on listings to leads, go to clubwealth.com forward slash L2L, clubwealth.com forward slash L2L. Uh, every top producer I know uses it. Uh, and all the, and, and all the, 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 our clients, or at least I just say all of them, but a good number of our clients that are uh, entry level agents also are using it because it's super affordable. It's like, I mean, and I hate to, I shouldn't be saying this because I know Scott's watching right now. Uh, I'm literally watching him type in comments as we're talking. And uh, so I really shouldn't say this, but man, he could be charging a lot more for this and people would pay it. And uh, Scott, do not raise prices, uh, but because we love the, the the very low prices you're offering. So that being said, guys, regardless of what the market does, you've got to stay focused and you can only control the controls. None of us can control what's going to happen with the market. None of us can control if they sell the foreclosures off to the hedge funds and they become rental properties, never to return to the market again. None of us can control uh, you know, what the economy as a whole does, but what we can control are our day- daily habits. And that's going to win the day. Uh, that's going to be the difference between agents that succeed and agents that fail. And whether you're professional or even empathetic, you can be successful. That the, the fact of the matter is, even if you know, even if let's say 80% of the people needed professional and you were just empathetic, look, if you, you're gonna get 20% of them at least, right? So go after them, do what you gotta uh, do. That's the 80-20 rule. Like the 20% of empathetics will do 80% of the business. And so that's just how it works. So like <laughs> they're gonna be creating some referrals from their experience. So the 80-20 works both ways. 20% of empathetics. That generate 80% of the income. So it's all good. That's just how, that's how the bandwidth works in the market. Oh, I'm going to let you have that last word. I freaking love you, coach. All right. All right. So, good stuff. That said, everybody, uh, we're peace out and we will see you at BSM. And again, on November 16th, we will see you uh, at the Leeds Listings and Leverage event in uh, in Sandy, Utah with Coach Aaron Dressel. So thank you. Thank you so okay. much, Coach Aaron. Thanks. Oh, Aaron, hey, really quick. Could you tell everybody why do you love going to club wealth events? You can you go to a lot of industry events. You can go to any event you want. Why do you keep coming back to club wealth events? The food. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's like they're really good. I mean, I think the the best part is you get people who are an open book. They share their best practices. You get people who are in the trenches, who are actually doing production, and they share their tools and their resources and what they've learned. Um, and that's like, that's probably the best part. And you get a lot of the collaboration and, uh, so I mean, obviously there's some cool classes, you get some great content, but then it's the conversations that happen between those classes. And it's the discussions that you get to meet with people and like all the stuff that happens after the events with all the relationships that are built. And that, I think that's the game changing piece because you can learn a lot of stuff in a lot of places, but at the same time, like these are people who are like an open book and they're willing to share stuff and stay in relationship after the event as well. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you very, very much for that. All right. Have an awesome day, coach. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. 87%. Yeah, that's the percentage of all real estate agents that get in the business today that'll be gone in two years. Let me tell you something. Why is there so much turnover in real estate? Because it isn't easy. And because most people don't know exactly what they need to do to get to the next level. Now look, regardless of whether you're brand new to the industry or you're a team leader, you've got 40 people on your team and you just want to get to the next level. If you're doing 10 transactions a year, you want to get to 25. You're doing 500 transactions a year, you want to get to 1,000. You're at 1,000, you want to get to 10,000. Let me tell you something. You need the right coach. Why? Because Club Wealth is the only coaching company on the planet that will literally guarantee that you will double your income or make at least an extra $100,000 your first year coaching with us, or we will give you 100% of your investment back. This is for people of all levels. Click the link below, sign up for the appropriate tier level, and let's get you a strategy session today. And I promise you, I 100% guarantee you, promise you, that you will walk away with a heart full of gratitude for the time that we took for you because you got so much value out of that call. Schedule your strategy session today. I promise you'll be glad you did. Sign up for a strategy session at clubwealth.com slash strategy session.